Okay. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. This is the place I call the basement library. It's very, very cozy in here. And on hot days, it's quite cool. Uh, it's full of books. Makes me very happy. And it's nice and quiet. It's late in the evening, exactly the perfect time to have a nice conversation with you all about storytelling. Uh, working well for you in Firefox. Excellent. Glad to glad to hear. Thank you all for coming today. It's a lovely pleasure to have you. And it's wonderful to see people from so many places. I'm seeing people from all over the U.S., Austin, Texas, Lawrence, Kansas, Atlanta, Georgia, Fort Worth, Maryland, California, just north of Toronto. Wonderful. Bakersfield. Man, you guys must be dying down there right now. Lord, it must be hot. Nashville, Tennessee area. Fantastic. And some international ones as well. We have someone from New Zealand. Fantastic. Ari Fisher. Welcome. That's really exciting. And from Norway. Wonderful. And I believe India as well. That's that's really exciting. I love it when people come internationally. And I know that this time is probably not the best for you all. Um, I did get a few complaining emails about how I'm catering to, uh, to the U.S. market. Uh, apologize. Uh, if you're all having trouble with... Uh, with your videos, uh, just make sure that you turn it on and make sure that the camera is working. Again, this there are some issues if you're not using uh, Chrome. Uh, the, the cameras might not even be on. Phoenix, Arizona has been over 110 degrees for 20 plus days now. Oh, my goodness. And if I can ask um, everyone uh, to make sure that your sound is muted during the, uh, during the recording um, so that we can get this seamless for you all uh you can't ashlyn can't hear anything and the mic test didn't work this might be an issue with uh with your browser sometimes uh you just have to turn turn it off and on again um make sure you are using chrome uh, there is a uh anna if you if you're hearing this if you can uh put into the chat the um the link that tests uh the browser and uh, the person's computer to make sure that their network is up to snuff. That would be great. Uh, James says there's a settings button by the video and audio buttons that you can configure speaking settings to. Thank you. Excellent. Michael, we'll take it as our motto, Bakersfield, at least it ain't Phoenix. <laughs> Microsoft Edge. Uh, Matt is seeing a black screen and can't hear anything. Okay. Sorry, guys, I'm going to put into, uh, into the chat again the reminder about. Uh, and there we go. Thank you, Anna, for the platform test. And the listen. Can you turn your sound off, please? Thank you. <laughs> and James mentions, okay, so there's a setting button for the video. Yeah, excellent. All right. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to get started. Um, Anna, if there are any uh, troubleshooting questions, if you can make sure that uh, you're answering them. Anybody who has questions that are uh, that have to do with the actual uh, webinar content, please leave them there. And like I mentioned before, uh, you're welcome to to um, leave them in the Q and A box as well. Uh, I'll probably give preference to the Q and A box, just so I don't have to scroll through everything. All right, I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna get started all right okay i can uh right There we go. Can you all confirm that you are seeing just the screen or are you seeing me in the main stage as well? Ah, you can see both. Then I'm going to remove myself. <laughs> all right, so no, that's not the one. All right. Momentarily forgot how to do this. <laughs> One second, everyone. Hmm. 
All right, let's try this again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn off my camera. No, nope, that doesn't work. Great. Silly me. All right, let's try that again. All right, I'm going to unshare and share again just to make sure that I get this exactly right, and then we can get going. Entire screen. Nope. Window. Perfect. Nicholas, if I may, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I believe on to the right of the main screen, there are three dots, and you can click pin yourself or unpin yourself, hide self view. That might give you the options you're looking for. I, I did that, but it's... Uh... Oh, there we go. You're right. Thank you, Anna. Okay. Wonderful. Let's get going. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to have you. It's a real pleasure. My name is Nicholas Kotar. I write epic fantasy and science fiction inspired by Slavic fairy tales. If you haven't heard about me, I write for readers who love classic fantasy, like the Lord of the Rings, especially like the Lord of the Rings. Not that I'm yet there. We, we can all aspire to reach the masters, even if we never quite reach them. But that is where I reach. It's right at the Lord of the Rings. But I also write for readers who aren't afraid of a little bit of darkness and a little bit of honesty about the human condition. In other words, I write myths, but myths for modern times. I also write for seekers after truth, people who love beauty, like myself. And for those who feel a little bit trapped by modernity, with what I hope is a fresh take on traditional forms of storytelling. You can find me on my personal website, nicholaskotar.com. You can find me on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Instagram. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I come from a family of Russian immigrants who moved from Russia after the revolution. It was quite, uh, quite a journey for them. They went through China. Uh, they ended up um, going with the White Army during the Civil War. At least my mom's side did. I ended up for a brief uh, period in Australia and eventually ended up on the West Coast. Uh, my father's side, uh, also Russian, but from the area of uh, far west Belarus. And my father found himself uh, born in a displaced persons camp uh, in Germany right after World War II. I grew up in what was essentially a Russian ghetto in the middle of San Francisco. It's weird, but they did have places like that. It's not quite like that anymore. But when I was growing up in the area that I lived, you could very comfortably get away with not speaking any English. All you needed was Russian or Chinese. Chinese was preferable, <laughs> but if you got it, you could get away with just Russian. And a lot of people did. Uh, there, a lot of the older people didn't speak any English at all. And perhaps not surprisingly, I actually spoke Russian before I spoke English. And I'm doing the same thing with my kids. My kids all start speaking Russian before they speak English. And I found for myself, it helps with the bilingual thing. My fascination with fantasy goes way back to the... My, my friends and I created an alternate version of Narnia. Uh, there is somewhere in the deep darkness of one of my closets, an original work written by myself and a friend of mine, traded by a few other friends of mine that we grew up with uh, way, way back in the day, uh, called The Golden Evergreen. Uh, the Golden Evergreen is an absolutely unabashed ripoff of Narnia, except we didn't have uh, C.S. Lewis's excellent talent for names. So we called the place Wreathlia, as in W-R-E-A-T-H, wreath. I don't know why. Maybe it had a lot of wreaths in it. I'm not entirely sure. It didn't have a white witch, but it did have a stone witch. And yes, she turned everything to stone. And an enchanted, pr enchanted princess who had been turned into a golden evergreen. So whenever we'd get bored with playing with our toys, we'd go outside. And uh, we'd run around, pretend we were on adventures like Peter and Susan and Lucy and Edmund. Except we were ourselves and we were in the magical land of Rethlea. And uh, we would look for cloud formations in the shape of lions. Why, do you ask? Well, in our world, that ver the ver our version of Aslan uh, would manifest himself as a cloud formation. And if he showed himself as a cloud formation, that was a good portent. And um, we don't know. I'm still not sure why, but we called him Seas. Um, S-E-A-Z-E, -E, if you want to know. So there we were outside, all of four, five, six, and seven, 
uh, with our good friends screaming at, at the skies. Seas! Seas! Where are you? I have no idea what the neighbors were thinking. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. I loved it. <laughs> My parents uh, ended up getting sick of of uh homeschooling us which is how we started so my mom tells the story that well she was sick of running after my sister and me uh, to force us to do our work in school so instead she started a school which she keeps telling that story and i'm still not entirely sure about the logic of that because it's way harder to start a school but anyway they founded saint john of san francisco academy uh, which is at at a time at the time um 1994 was one of the only K through 12 classical schools in the nation, I believe. And it's still considered to be a shining light of uh, classical education, especially in the Orthodox community. After studying Russian literature at UC Berkeley, yes, what else would I do? I came back to teach at St. John's for seven years. And during that time, a few of us teachers would join up every once in a while. And we ended up forming a storytelling troupe that inspired me to write a novel eventually called Raven Sun, which was the kernel that eventually became the Song of the Seer, my first completed novel. After traveling through every continent except Antarctica, although that might happen still, you never know, and meeting my lovely wife, we moved to a tiny hamlet in upstate New York called Jordanville. Uh, now we're slightly outside of Jordanville, but uh, I, I serve as a, as a deacon in the Holy Trinity Monastery there. Uh, next to the monastery is the Holy Trinity Russian Orthodox Seminary, where I teach music, where I conduct the men's choir, and I pretend to be something like a homesteader with my wife and my four children. And uh, in the mean, in the, my spare time, haha, I don't have any, I uh, do fun things like adventure races. And if you don't know what that is, you can ask me about it in the Q&A. At the core of all my work is a fervent belief that telling, writing, watching, listening to, and reading good stories, but especially telling them, may be the most important thing you do with your life, especially now. For myself, that means that I've authored seven fantasy no fantasy books, both novels and novellas, three nonfiction books, a TV script that won several awards, and uh, for a while was looked at by Netflix. Now, now they're not looking at anything because because of the uh, because of all of the uh, strikes. And I've also written a full length classical music libretto, you know, just to spice it up a little bit. Some of my current projects include three new books which is coming hopefully within the next two months or so writing courses designed to inspire budding creatives new translations of slavic fairy tales uh, which i also tell in a podcast speaking of events across the u.s and regular podcasts reviewing sharing great stories so might be here because you've heard me on the in a, in a certain kingdom podcast podcast that i've had for a, a little while on the ancient faith network um, recently i've taken it off the ancient faith network and um, because I had chronic laryngitis last year, I couldn't speak for almost six months. Um, and for a conductor of music, you can imagine how disastrous that was. Uh, but I had to I had to stop doing the voice of Baba Yaga. For those of you who know, you know why, because she's very obnoxious and she speaks very loudly. Uh, so I'm happy to tell those of you who know my work in the podcast space that uh, In a Certain Kingdom will be back in a different form very, very soon. Natalie has new music for it. So uh, you can ask me about that in the Q&A as well, if you like. Now, before we get into our main topic today, before I teach you about the three te best techniques uh, to tell better stories, I want to address an important question. Why write at all? Some of you probably don't even have that question. I hope most of you don't think about it too much. I hope most of you are in the camp of saying, I can't not write. But that's not everybody, I understand. And sometimes we have better things we think, to do with our time. And let's be honest, writing, it's hard work. It's a greatly joyful bit of work, but it's hard. I don't know if you agree, but I strongly believe that becoming a storyteller now may be the most important thing you can do right now in this moment. And let me explain what I mean. Simply put, the stories that are being told today, they're getting worse and worse. Now, I'm not going to go all political on you. I'm not going to talk about woke this, woke that. But I will tell you that it's absolutely undeniable that the kind of storytelling that binds and unites a an entire society together, the kinds of books that used to that used to drive people in droves to bookstores, the kinds of movies that got stand in line for hours. I mean, I remember standing in line for 
six hours for the reissue of the Star Wars special editions in San Francisco at the Coronet, uh, back when that place was still open. These were events. These were events, endless events. They weren't simply about entertainment. They were something that really brought people together. And that's no small thing. And I think we're starting to feel that right now, especially in the wake of the pandemic. If the pandemic has shown us anything. It's that the kinds of stories that used to bind us together and that did work a little bit during the beginning of the pandemic to bring us together against the common enemy broke down really, really quickly. By year two of the pandemic, the narrative was dividing the story that was that was trying to be that that was being told to us was doing more to divide people than it was to unify them. And that's being reflected not only in the quality of the stories that we are consuming as on our on our televisions, in the movie theaters, even in bookstores. It's it's simply the the fact, a fact, that even the really good stories, even the really good shows, even the good movies, do not have the same kind of cachet, do not have the same kind of unifying force as they used to even as recently as 10, 15 years ago. Now, some might say, maybe that's a good thing. And I've actually, when I've made this point in in other places, I've been challenged on this, where people say, well, isn't this a good thing? Isn't this an opportunity for marginalized voices, for new storytelling techniques, for new stories to be told? And on the surface, you would you would think that's true. Now that there is no central stage, so to speak, where people can all gather together and unite in their love for a common property, for a common franchise, for a common story... Maybe it is an opportunity, a time for other stories that have been told before that have been pushed out by a more mainstream kind of storytelling. Maybe it's time for them to rise up. But in actual fact, that's not what we're seeing. We are seeing plenty of different kinds of stories appearing, but they're not having the same kind of unifying force. And more often than not, they are not the same level of quality. The same kind of searching towards consolation, the kind of thing that Tolkien talks about over and over again in his essays, the kind of thing that people around a common hearth, the kinds of stories that you passed on from generation to generation through oral storytelling way back when. We don't have that anymore. Tropes are being worn out. And the inversions that we used to think were funny, like in Shrek, are no longer shocking or interesting. They've become banal. They've become the thing. They're no, they're no longer inversions. So it's almost like we're at a point where inverting the inversion is becoming a male thing. And I don't think I'm alone in feeling like, feeling this way. Yeah, of course there are exceptions. There are some stories that do bind people together for a short period of time. But there's another problem. The internet is the kind of medium that doesn't tend to allow for a large group of people, for a large community to form for any lasting period of time. The thing the internet is very good at is allowing many different voices to be heard, but it doesn't give them a lot of staying power. It tends to dilute voices. It's a huge fire hose of information. There are exceptions, like I said, but I think most of us know that the stories that are being told today just don't hold water. They're not as good as they used to be. But this actually creates both an opportunity and a need for storytellers who are sowing the seeds of something special, the kinds of stories that are going to be, once again, the unifying force for a divided people for a divided society. But we're not doing this on our own. In our own time of inner and outer fracturing that seems to be getting worse by the day, there are masters of the craft who inspire us to think, to act, and to live differently. More in tune with our age-old faith and less pandering to the demands of this fickle world, whose demands change all the time, every five minutes. Those masters give us a pattern for how to tell eternal stories that will transform our whole selves. But we're not just retelling good stories. Once we learn the tools of the trade, are are those, and believe me, you need to know them even if you then go on to break all of them. Once we understand the patterns that build lasting stories, patterns that I will send, persist for thousands of years, and those of you who are storytellers just simply know this to be a fact. These patterns, they persist for thousands of years. Once we understand them, once we really appreciate that there are such things, there are such patterns, there are such tools that make stories good. We, we can then add our own voices and our own perspectives and our own new approaches only at that point. And that's something we are not seeing right now. But 
there is an opportunity ahead of us. There's a great need for good writers and storytellers, and we are seeing that need clamored for by readers. Jonathan Pajot's recent fantastically successful Kickstarter on a what would seem to be simple illustrated short story version of the Snow White story, a, a story that everybody seems to know. Do we really need another illustrated Snow White? And yet it raised over 300,000 US dollars and it could have raised more and it probably will raise more in sales on the back end of the Kickstarter. And the outpouring of gratitude from people, from mothers of children, from lovers of story, and from simple, simply people who love to hold beautiful things in their hand, who love to recognize the old patterns of stories as they used to be heard by them in their childhood, when their grandmothers would sit them on their on her knee and tell them those old, those deep, those profound stories. This is what people want. And this is what we can come back to. Now more than ever, we have an opportunity. You and I, us storytellers, to reclaim the wider conversation that's happening in our culture. People are hungry. They are hungry for good stories. The thing is, writing and storytelling is a vocation. And writing especially is a vocation that needs training. It's not simply a call to create. Many of us have that. But unless we understand how to hone, how to use that call to, to create something, finely honed, fine, beautifully wrought, we will simply be wasting our opportunity. This call that we hear, it's a call to be a storyteller to the best of our ability and to always, always keep growing in our skill. Because the fact is that the craft of writing is something you learn again and again and again. You relearn it, you hone it, you expand your knowledge of it for your entire life. And every successful writer, writers who have written hundreds of books will always tell you that. Every book is a new experience. Every book is an opportunity to learn a new tool. Every story is a new quest into the world of patterns, into the world of tropes, into the world of old storytelling traditions. There's an art to storytelling, just as there's an art to painting. Myself, I've spent literally thousands of dollars on writing programs, on books, calling various techniques from my own writing, and synthesizing the best that's out there for other writers. Because those things that I found, they work, they work for me, and they have worked for others. So today's webinar is meant not only to inspire you, but also to equip you with the tools you need to become a better writer. I'll start by sharing the one piece of advice that changed my writing in the most significant way possible. It was literally one thing that flipped everything on its head. Now, I'd always considered myself a writer, and I'd always been a writer. Since childhood, you, I had scribbled in notebooks. I did rip-offs of Star Wars that turned into rip-offs of Lord of the Rings that turned into rip-offs of Narnia. This is how you learn. I spent my childhood and adulthood writing. I never stopped. But for the longest time, I couldn't get anyone to read more than a page or so of what I'd written. And I used to think, simply, this is a matter of the internet being that place where you can get lost unless you already have an existing audience. And I used to think, well, it's just a matter of me trying to pedal it to as many people as possible. Keep showing it to people. Keep showing it. And eventually, it will catch a spark and go insane. Everybody has delusions of J.K. Rowling. Well, J.K. Rowling in her early stages, not in the witch trial stage that she is undergoing right now. And eventually, it got to a point where huh, it got a little bit painful. So there was this writer site that I used to frequent. And it was an opportunity for writers to find critique partners. But it was also an opportunity for writers to share their work in a space where there was a possibility, however faint and however insubstantial, of actual book editors and agents seeing your work. Those of you who are writers in the early 2000s will remember these places. Uh, they were set up by publishing houses. They had forums, they had places to post your work, and they had they gamified the system in such a way that you, if you had a certain number of critiques, and if the critiques were highly ranked, and if you had a lot of reads, your books would get pushed up by an internal algorithm. And eventually, the promise was that if you reached a certain very high level, an editor from one of, from the publishing house that set up the um, website would actually look at your book. In practice, this hardly ever happened. And I'm not actually entirely sure what the purpose of it was. And practically speaking, it didn't work. 
And there were some trolls who really loved living in those forums. There was one in there. He was just a remarkable man. Himself, he had published one book. He was an older man. And it seemed like his entire life's work at this point was not to write new books, but was simply to eviscerate. I'm speaking not literally, but it felt like an evisceration to eviscerate new writers and to tell them everything that, did, that they did was wrong. And it was. It was really painful. I asked him, I actually asked him to look at one of my books, one of my chapters, in an early version of what eventually became the Song of the Seeret. And uh, the response I got was three pages of ranting. And man, it was personal. It was like, you should never write again. You are a waste of breath. Why are you doing this? Stop wasting time. But in there, in the middle of all that pain, he had some practical advice. In And in there was one of the most valuable things I had ever heard. Now, at that point, I wasn't ready to hear it. And it took me a little while to get over the pain. But eventually, I actually listened. I actually learned. I started to pay attention. And I realized he was right. Because he told me what the number one mistake that all beginning writers make. And he was right. The number one mistake, what my story was missing at that point, was it had no voice. Now, some of you some of you might jump out of your chairs right now, especially if you're not beginning writers and writers, and you might think, Are you kidding me? Voice? Voice is a modern uh, young adult manifestation of a certain kind of storytelling style that leans super heavily on the author being authentic. Well, I'm not using voice in that sense. I'm using voice in the sense that the, the character whose point of view we are seeing the story from has a voice that is that character's. This concept, the concept of voice in that sense, is something we're actually not taught in high school English class. Because we don't need to understand point of view or how it works in fiction. We don't need to have a voice when we're writing essays. In fact, we're discouraged from having any sort of voice when we're writing them or writing book reports. Sometimes we may not have learned these concepts, even if we've taken creative writing courses. And that's really unfortunate, but it does happen. Because if you're writing something like poetry, or even a short story. The short stories can be more experimental. And you as an author have a strong voice. You can get away without having a strongly developed voice for the point of view character. But in longer narrative works, if your characters don't have voice, if they don't have a properly formulated point of view, your book will never sell. A lot of beginning writers write their stories almost like their essays. But the rules of story writing are different than the rules of essay writing. But there are rules, and they are actually incredibly freeing. This was something I was very surprised about, because as soon as I realized what it was that I was doing wrong, it was like an entire vista opened up to me. When I realized that what I was doing was basically writing about a story instead of telling a story through the voice of of an actual character who had goals, motivations, desires, and very real conflicts that were specific and unique to that character. I couldn't do it. I couldn't make it work. But when I started to do that, the floodgates opened. I got multiple agents interested in my work. And I got the call very soon after that. That's another story. If you want to hear the story about my agent, we can get into that in the Q&A. I never ended up selling a book with my agent. But that was actually the best thing that happened to me. But that's a story for another time. So this leads us to technique number one. You have to tell your story through a specific point of view. You have to pick it and you have to stick with it. Using point of view and voice can make the difference between people paying absolutely no attention to your story and sending constant form rejections, the worst thing, and agents fighting over your story and publishing your novel for financial success and acclaim. I know because it was that moment that I figured it out that I started to sell. So what is point of view? What is voice? Point of view is a technical term for who is telling the story, inside the story, the character through whose eyes we see the story. Now, sometimes that character is the narrator. Sometimes that character is not the main character. It's a side character. The relation to their story is just as much an important part of the point of view as the point of view itself. The person who's telling the story is called the viewpoint character. In this context, what we're talking about when we're talking about voice means the voice 
of the character, the viewpoint character who, that tells the story. It has nothing to do with the authenticity of the author, which is a more frequent usage of the word these days. Not talking about voice heavy fiction, something like N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy, uh, trilogy, which is a very voice heavy work. But the voice is heavy and effective because she she does point of view incredibly well. She's even one of the few brave people to use second person point of view. If you want to know about that, more about that, do ask me about it. It's a fascinating uh, exercise in very advanced writing style. So what kind of viewpoints can you use as a fiction writer? Well, you can use first person. It's a very popular one these days. Although some writers uh, consider that first person, especially in present tense, is, is uh, anathema. I've heard Orson Scott Card actually say that it's one of the stupidest things any writer can do. But a lot of young adult fiction does use first person, especially in present tense. Limited third person. Limited third is what, what, what uh, most fantasy novels and science fiction novels these days use. Uh, it's basically the closest thing to first person that you can have while also remaining third person. You're so deeply behind the eyes, inside the head of the viewpoint character, that even though the tense used is third person, you are immediately within the action. Now, it's called limited because your field of vision is entirely limited by what that character can see. Nothing else is possible for the reader to see. And that makes for a very immediate, very powerful form of storytelling. It's why it's so common and frequently used these days. Omniscient third person is was a more popular point of view in the 19th century. This is what uh, Jane Austen uses very often. This is what uh, Dickens used. This is what, Jay, what uh, George Eliot used. It's not as frequently used these days because it's a more of a distancing technique. So the reader doesn't feel as immediately connected to the characters. <laughs> it also allows for a... Um, the narrator himself or herself to be a very active character within the story. Omniscient third person also allows the the writer to descend for limited times and in occasional scenes into limited third person. This is something that Tolkien does to absolute perfection in The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings is an, is an omniscient third person narrative. The character, the character of the narrator is very strong. Not as strong as in The Hobbit, but still very strong. However, that narrator does dive into the heads of individual characters for little mini bits of scenes every once in a while. So this is a very powerful um, technique and point of view because it allows the author a lot of flexibility and a lot of different options to tell the story in an interesting way. Detached author, objective narrator, is a very, very difficult way to tell a story. This is when the narrator has absolutely no emotional investment in the events of the, of the scene. And it could be a character in the story, in which case the character has some sort of a handicap or some sort of a problem. Sometimes when you're telling the story from the perspective of a villain, and that villain is sociopath or some a person with some emotional issues, you will have scenes or sometimes entire books in detached author uh, viewpoint, point of view. It's very difficult to maintain for a long time. And readers tend to not favor it for a very long time because it is a very distancing kind of technique. There are more viewpoint styles. But these are the most popular. Really immersing a reader in a viewpoint character's physical experience of the world by sticking to a viewpoint throughout an entire scene or chapter and seeing their reactions to the world, their emotional responses to the stimuli that they see around them, the sensory details and the events and the people that they interact with. This is what makes for compelling writing. A lot of beginning writers don't even know that there are rules that govern this. And so they change points of view inside scenes. When they do that, what ends up happening is that they break a very important rule, the rule of dramatic tension. So for example, imagine a scene in, let's say, a high school dance, right? And uh, the viewpoint character is the girl who walks in. She's very shy. She's new to the small town. And she sees the cute boy across the hall. And she really wants to dance with him. A beginning writer might, at that point, immediately switch the viewpoint of the boy as he looks at the girl and might tell the audience what the boy is thinking. If he does that, if the, if the writer does that, you've lost the reader because the reader doesn't want to know what the boy is thinking. The reader is in the head of the girl. The girl can't possibly read the boy's mind. She might intuit some uh, emotional realities from his body language, and she probably is, let's be honest. <coughs> but she can't read his mind. So if you do that, you're breaking 
simple laws of physics, but more importantly, you're breaking laws that make that allow for the reader to have an emotional connection with the character. Once you understand that you can't do things like this, once you understand the reason the rules exist, you can really start to use this technique to make powerfully compelling characters because you're so deep inside them that they start to do things that you would never have expected. Because when you live inside them, you start to think like them, you start to talk like them. In your off times, when you're not actually writing, you will in some sense be them and they will tell you what they want to do. Sometimes those are not things that you thought you wanted for the character. It makes for a very interesting experience. By the way, those kinds of things, when that happens, when the character takes his or her own path through the story, those story arcs tend to be the most interesting for readers because they're the most prop that they're the ones that the ones that use most properly this technique of being true to a viewpoint, to a point of view. Now, to really understand this concept, there's no going around it. You have to read great literature with its under with this understanding in your mind. Something that I teach in my writing courses and something that I think is really important. This equips you with an ability to really get inside your viewpoint character's brain. But it also allows you to do something that's quite unusual. It allows you to hear your story as a reader does. That's something that will give your novel the driving force and spirit that makes it feel authentic, makes it feel real, and makes your readers want to know what on earth is going to happen next. Which leads me to technique number, number two. Learning how to hear your story as a reader would hear it. This skill implies a technical understanding of how to make tone translate into auditory signals perfectly. There are some key technical concepts about how language is shaped and how language shapes the sound of your story. And yes, we're going to have to talk about some technical terms that you might not be happy to hear about. But if you hear your story properly, it will make your prose clean, intense, and extremely vivid. Understanding the basic elements of the narrative sentence means understanding how a story is told, what moves the story, what and what can clog it. This is the purpose of the narrative sentence, to lead from one sentence to another, to the, to the next, to the next, to the next, because that's how a story is made, from sentence to sentence. You know the old, the old saying about how to eat an elephant? Bite by bite. How do you write a story? How do you write a 300,000-page novel? Sentence by sentence. So it's essential to understand forward movement, pace, and rhythm. To do that, to understand those bigger concepts, which are difficult to master, and they take sometimes an entire lifetime to do well, we still have to start at the most granular, granular level of all. We have to examine the elements of language itself. The things that we learned in grammar class. Oh no, I hear you all groaning when you're look, seeing words that you thought you would never have to look at again. Words like syntax. Words like adjectives, adverbs. Oh goodness, is he actually going to be talking about semicolons? Yep, punctuation is in there. Narrative sentence and the par and paragraph rhythm and repetition. Adjectives, adverbs, tense, person. Oh Lord. Most important though implicit narration how you share information in a way that doesn't give the reader doesn't feel to the reader like the author is hitting them on the head with obvious information you can only do that by properly crafting a sentence a good writer like a good reader has a mind's ear a story is made out of language love it love it or hate it it's true grammar is important <laughs> and language can and does express itself in delight, just as music does. Here's an example from Zora Neale Hurston's From Their Eyes Were Watching God. I can't go into all of these concepts in detail here, but I will give you one example. This comes from my writing course called The Art of Storytelling. So the beginning of this was a woman, and she had come back from burying the dead. Not the dead of sick and ailing with friends at the pillow and feet. She had come back from the sodden and the bloated, the sudden dead, their eyes flung wide open in judgment. The people all saw her come because it was sundown. The sun was gone, but he had left his footprints in the sky. It was the time for sitting on porches beside the road, 
It was the time to hear things and talk. These sitters had been tongueless, earless, eyeless conveniences all day long. Mules and other brutes had occupied their skins, but now the sun and the boss man were gone, so the skins felt powerful and human. They became lords of sounds and lesser things. They passed nations through their mouths. They sat in judgment. Seeing the woman as she was made them remember the envy they had stored up from other times, so they chewed up the back parts of their minds and swallowed with relish. They made burning statements with questions and killing tools out of laughs. It was mass cruelty, a mood come alive, words walking without masters, walking altogether like harmony in a song. This is a great example of how effective language can be when you really understand how each element works. What's so amazing about this is that the rhythm here is almost song-like, almost poetic in a lot of these sentences, which some of your writing coaches will tell you can have the propensity to put a reader to sleep. If you have repeated patterns in your writing, you will often hear editors say, your reader will fall asleep. And yet notice that every time she goes into a long sentence that has complex construction, she will then immediately modulate it with a short sentence like, it was mass cruelty, a mood come alive. And that stops you in your tracks and makes you realize, oh, wow, this is where we are. This is what's going on. Wakes you up from that, that spell of the music that is simultaneously gorgeous and horrifying. Even though the language is lulling, beautiful, poetic, the reality of what is speaking is harsh and awful. It creates such a dissonance in the reader. You're reading the words. They're making beautiful sounds in your head. And yet, when you stop to think about the reality of what they're describing, you are in utter horror. And that makes for such an incredible dissonance, emotional dissonance in the reader's mind and heart. It makes for very compelling reading. And then that kind of disconnect that can only be created by loveliness in language makes this kind of passage beautiful, powerful, creating an effect that your mind's ear can hear. Another element of making your prose extremely intense and vivid is to know how to let your characters take on a life of their own to the point, like I talked about a little bit already, where they begin talking and acting independently of you as an author. Well, almost. You're always doing the work, but still, they do have a mind of their own. I'm sure you've heard writers talk about this, and I hope you've had experiences of this as well yourselves. This is also related to the elements of language because you have to learn to listen and to let the characters, not just the language, but the characters and their own voices, which are not your own, to speak through you. I won't get into that in detail today, but that's another concept I cover in a lot of detail and with a lot of love, because I think this is a fascinating topic, I teach it in my Art of Storytelling writing course, which I'll tell you about a little more later. Now, what are the elements of storytelling? Things like how to build a sentence, how to use the elements of language to create an effect that you can hear. How do you then go to the next step and build a habit of writing? After all, what good is knowing all the concepts if every time you sit down to write, you're confronted by the most terrifying thing in the world, the blank page? I think you all know this. The number one thing writers complain about is writer's block. Yeah, I have news for you. There's actually a rather simple fix for what most of us think is writer's block. I didn't say it was easy. I said it was simple. Those are different. But to get to that answer, we have to get into something that's a little bit adjacent to writing, but still very important. We have to understand attention. In his, in his Pulitzer Prize finalist book, The Shallows, Nicholas Carr makes a really interesting argument about what the internet is doing to our brains. An argument, by the way, that he made before smartphones. He was talking about the internet on desktop computers. And already his prognosis was frightening. He says that the rise of reading on the internet, on screens, is something as earth-shattering in its cultural impact as the printing press was. He talks about Marshall McLuhan's famous saying about the medium being the message. And he reminds us that the medium actually determines the content of the message. That's what that famous phrase means. The medium you use does 
affect the message. Whether you read a book on an e-reader or in physical format does affect the way that you read it. You might pretend that it doesn't, but it's simple fact. And actually, it has been quite clearly shown in some very ne interesting neurological studies. Carr then goes on to argue that the internet has made us far less able to hold on to long and complicated thought processes that we were able to when we were reading long-form work in physical books. He's basically saying that the internet encourages a certain kind of quick reading that by its nature is not deep. You might have heard of the F-curve. The way that most people read on the internet is roughly in the shape of an F. So their attention is held on the top line of the F, of a capital F letter. In other words, the first few lines of, an, of some content on the internet is usually given a significant amount of attention. Then the attention wanders, and you start to skim until you realize what you're doing. You stop, and you give it a little bit more attention right around the middle. Then you get bored, and you continue skimming all the way to the end. And this has been borne out, out in... <clears throat> In uh, experiment after experiment, this is how most people read on the internet. Because of that, Nicholas Carr argues that our brains are actually changing in their shapes to the point where they are incapable or at least limited in our ability to have long and drawn out periods of work. So our ability to think deeply is connected to our ability to read deeply. And both of those are connected to our ability to work deeply. He argues that our brains are actually changing physical shape. And he makes a really interesting argument. He cites a fascinating neurological study done of cabbies in London. Now, the, now it used to be the case that cabbies in London, cab drivers in London, used to have to memorize the entire web, the entire map of London City, all of it, with all of its circles. It's a massive city. This was such a huge amount of information that it was actually called the information. No, sorry, it was called the knowledge. That's what it was called, the knowledge. Yeah, like capital T, capital K. And they all had to learn it, and they did. There were scans made of people who had the knowledge in their brains. Then they were brought back after a period of time when the knowledge was no longer needed, when GPS machines started to take over. And it was actually found that those cabbies who had who had known the knowledge and lost it, lost a certain physical area of their brain. There was an area of their brain that governed long, uh, long term memory that shrank physically. Really scary thought, actually. Now we live in an on an endorphin driven sense that we are very intelligent. That's what the internet does to us. And let's be honest, it can give us the entirety almost, of human knowledge throughout human history. At our fingertips, we have almost the literal Library of Alexandria times a thousand. So the ability to flip from one bit of information to the other and understand it gives our brains a false sense of extreme intelligence. And we think we're capable of processing quickly and a lot. <clears throat> we do tend to think that we are much more intelligent than our forebears because of that. The problem is that this has also led to something very serious. It's called. It's partially connected to something called decision fatigue. Because the internet is built on the idea of reading information quickly, what happens is that our attention begins to fragment very quickly, especially if we don't allow ourselves the possibility of delving deeply into a single point, a single access point of information. In the business world, the rise of social media, or even email, or Trello and Slack means we're, as business people constantly, or as workers constantly jumping back and forth between information. Anybody who's a knowledge worker understands this issue. It's really hard to focus your brain long enough to do one sustained job on the internet because you're constantly wanting the endorphin um, hit of looking at your email and seeing a new bit of information that you can consume quickly, a bit of candy, intellectual candy. And the truth is that every time we distract ourselves like this, our brain takes 20 minutes on average to focus enough to be able to do deep work. For more information on this, check out Cal Newport's wonderful book, Deep Work, or simply listen to his uh, Deep Questions podcast. There's a lot of information on that there.
The point I'm trying to make here is that we have, have to actively work against this reality even before we sit down to write, especially if we're going to write something long that requires deep, concentrated work that hurts something like a novel. This problem is, is directly related to the hurdle of the blank page. So how can we combat it? There's actually a lot more science to all of this that I'm delving into today. Uh, you can find it anywhere. There's a lot of information on this. Just look at look look in Google, for goodness sake. But I'll summarize one way we can regain our ability to attend to something deeply for a long time. This leads us to technique number three, building a writing ritual using self-automation. What is self-automation? Well, Michael Hyatt, a popular writer and speaker, discusses a topic called self-automation in his book and course, Free to Focus. Self-automation, he says, is a process that involves implementing routines, rituals, and habits to make it easier and more efficient for you to follow up on your highest priorities. The focus is to put as many things in your life on autopilot as possible, so you don't have to stop and think about them every time they come up. You want to build rituals and routines so that your body knows what to do, even if you aren't consciously thinking about it. How does this work? Well, it's taking a shower. I don't know if you ever noticed this, but you sometimes have your best ideas when you're showering, or when you're taking a walk and not thinking about anything, or when you're doing something like washing the dishes, something repetitive, something routine, something habitual, something that has a flavor of the ritual about it because it repeats itself. What happens is that the brain in those situations understands that the body is safe. Rituals, routines, and habits are things that have been broken through the lizard brain, so to speak, and imposed on our fear of doing difficult work because we have come to understand that these things that we're doing, they're habitual, they're normal, they don't take a lot of effort. And so when that happens, the mind is able to play. It's able to make weird connections that no one ever expected. It's able to write, to ideate, to come up with cool story ideas. Same thing happens when you have a writing ritual. What rituals do, technically speaking, is they turn off our critical voice. They liberate our creative, playful side because writing is play. Writing is, it should be, a joy. And when it's really coming out in a torrent, you can feel it. My routine, for example, involves taking a long walk, coming home, cleaning out the coffee maker, pressing, uh, sorry, grinding a new bunch of specially chosen coffee that I bought at a really nice cafe, taking out my special writing mug, listening to a little bit of either an audiobook or a podcast, which might be counterintuitive, you think, because it might you know pollute your mind with ideas. No, because it's a habitual act, my brain actually doesn't listen all that intently. It simply allows the information to come in. And sometimes ideas are made that way. Then I go into my writing space. I put on these guys. I turn on 16th century Renaissance polyphony. Yes, that specific. Mostly by the Talos scholars. Pretty much 90% by the Talos scholars. And I open my computer. At which point, I open Scrivener and I cycle through the previous day's work. This is not an edit. This is a very light reread of the work that I did the previous day. I'm trying to avoid my editing hat. I'm simply enjoying the story that I wrote. If something jumps out at me as being obviously wrong, I'll fix it. But I'm not allowing my critical voice, my critical brain, to have any say. And I've already turned it off because I've done all these actions that are habitual, right? By cycling through my my previous day's work, as soon as I get to the point where I stopped, I know exactly where the story's going. I'm inside the character's head and I'm excited. This is a really, really good technique, no matter what your routine or ritual is, to include a cycling ritual where you cycle back through the writing of the previous day. Even if you didn't get any writing done for a few days or a few weeks, it really does help. Eventually, rituals help us reach something called flow state. Flow state is when you don't even know that you're writing. <laughs> you're lost in your characters. And if you do it right, this can last sometimes for hours. <laughs> when I was writing book five of my Raven Sun series, I could routinely churn out 10,000 words a day, and I'm not writing full-time. 10,000 words for a full-time writer is pretty standard. 
For me, this is like in two or three hours. That kind of output is insane. And I'm not because because I'm not somebody who writes fast. Some of you might might be, and you might think, yeah, ten thousand, no big deal. For me, that's a lot. This is all coming from someone who used rituals to the point where I in, ended up writing five books in in the Raven Sun series. Actually, now it's six and one bridge novel to a new series. And all I had to do was follow the steps, sit down, and I'd be writing. And very often, flow state would come automatically. The detailed techniques of creating a writing ritual is something that I cover in full with examples of successful writers, classic writers, people like John Steinbeck, people who we consider to be the greatest writers uh, of the last 200 years. I share all that in my writing courses. All these concepts I shared with you today, <laughs> I did on a crash course surface level. And I cover them in a lot of detail in my writing course, the art of storytelling, guidepost structure and style along with many more concepts that we didn't have time for today. For those of you who have followed my work, this course was formally titled Guideposts to Your Story. So if you've purchased it, this is the same course. In this course, I provide a thorough training into how to hear your story. I explain the mechanics that make or break your story. I help you with the self-editing process of which language to keep and which and what to discard. I guide you through how the masters use point of view and voice to capture and keep their reader's attention. Honestly, I think the biggest advantage, the biggest selling point of this course is that there's a lot of examples from really amazing writers on how to do it well. So I don't simply preach at you. I show you how the real people have done it. I show you how Tolkien does it. I show you how Jane Austen does it. I show you how <clears throat> Ursula Le Guin does it. I also explain how to achieve flow in your story, how to deliver information in an organic way that will fool your reader into thinking that they figured out the story by themselves. And then I do a deep dive into creating a ritual that gets you into a flow state so you can minimize writer's block and maximize productivity whenever you sit down to write. Along the way, you'll complete some really good, short and effective writing exercises to internalize the concepts we discuss. So you can begin applying all of the practices of, of effective writing in your own personal projects. Each lesson encapsulates the most important concepts of the structure and style of narrative writing, especially fiction, that I learned from spending thousands of dollars on writing courses and books and putting them all together for your benefit. I use these techniques every day in my own writing. They have proven extremely valuable in making me a pretty prolific writer. I still don't think I'm as prolific as I could be, but I'm working at it. The course gives you a firm foundation in narrative structure and style. It's got tons of examples from the masters that are really good. It guides you through exercises, very effective, very targeted exercise. To internalize the techniques, these exercises is that you can come back to them year after year after year, and they will continue to be used. Not the kind of thing that you do once and it never works again. They are really good because every time you come back to them after you've had a little bit of time, after you've grown as a writer, you can do things in a different way. You can do them in a better way. And you realize you can see by repeating them how much you have learned and how your toolbox has become more rich. I've had great reviews from students who have taken this course. So I know the techniques I use are effective for a lot of people. Robert in Kentucky has said that story ideas started to pour out of him like a fountain. Nathan said, this class helped me in my attempts at finding a daily writing routine and ritual and has pushed me to simply get the work done. <laughs> also, I quickly figured out which point of view was right for the story after speaking with Deacon Nicholas. And Brittany, in a wonderful review, I think Brittany's here actually, hi Brittany, uh, said, it's not an English class, but an art class. I stopped seeing parts of speech as just ingredients for writing and instead started seeing them as the artistic tools they really are. What color theory and brush strokes are for painters, point of view and punctuation are for writers. Adjectives and verbs, these are a writer's acrylics and oils. They aren't just things to notice in the finished piece. They are the piece. Each class left me feeling like I had just discovered a new way to write a character, a scene, or even just a piece of dialogue, and I couldn't wait to give the exercises a try. I highly recommend this course to anyone who not only wants to brush up on their writing skills, but who wants to rekindle their relationship with the true art and craft of writing. Thank you, Brittany. Beautiful, beautiful words. 
So the art of, if the art of storytelling is something you want to master, I have a special gift for you. Normally, guidepost to structure and style is priced at $397. Today, and only today, I'm offering you a deep discount. Because as I said at the beginning of the webinar, I think our world is in dire need of your good stories. We have an opportunity right now, like never before, to capitalize on that. If you sign up for the course before midnight tonight, not very very long from now, it's about three hours from now, you'll get $150 off, meaning you can take the full course for just $247. If you need a little more time to think about it, you have until midnight tomorrow to get $100 off the course. So if you sign up within 24 hours, you can get it for $297. Uh, Anna is going to place the link for the course sign up in our chat box right now. Please note that this course is hosted on Teachable. So you'll need to create an account with your name and email address before purchasing the class. This can be a little bit confusing. Uh, a lot of people come on to Teachable and they get stuck on the creating an account stage. It's annoying. I agree. Eventually, we're going to take it. We're going to move it to a better platform. At this point, this is where we are. So don't get phased by it. It's simply part of the process. When you get to the purchase page, don't forget to apply the discount codes that I've listed on the screen. Again, the code 150OFF, 150OFF, is available until midnight tonight, Eastern time. That's in three hours. So sign up now to get the deepest discount. It's the deepest discount I've ever offered for this course. The code 100OFF, 100OFF, is available until midnight tomorrow, Eastern time. I want to close by thanking all of you for coming. I hope that you've gained something valuable from today's webinar that will further your own storytelling. The world desperately needs your beautiful stories. As promised, we'll have a bit of a Q&A. Questions about the concepts we covered, about the course, how to buy it, how the codes work, what do you get, questions about me, questions about my writing, anything you like. It's all up for grabs. I'm going to just make sure that we have that link in the chat. And I'm going to be back in a second. Myself. All right. Most of you stayed. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, there, yes, the, Anna, thank you. You've, uh, you've put in the, um, the, co the uh, link. Thank you so much. All right, let's see. Uh, Vimal, thank you. Thank you for coming along. Let's see what questions we got here. Yeah, Anna, Anna is an excellent, excellent assistant. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, let's start with the Q and A's. Um, Anna, if you if you mind if you wouldn't mind going through the chat and maybe putting in the questions in the Q and A box, that might make it easier. All right, let's go by time. Oh, actually, they're all just randomly <laughs> put in there. Oh, you can upvote questions. Fantastic. I forgot about that. All right, David Markham, you asked, do I have any news on the St. Basil Writers Workshop? I do have some news about the St. Basil's Writing Workshop. Um, perhaps I should leave it to the end, but no, I think I'm going to talk about that right now. So for those who don't know, St. Basil's Writing Writing Workshop is the granddaddy of them all when it comes to uh, instruction in the craft of writing. Last year, I somehow managed to collect paul kingsnorth jonathan pajot uh catherine hyde who's a fantastic writer of mysteries and fantasy and nicole rokas who's a a trauma coach uh and a writing coach fantastic teacher and myself to do the definite the definitive writing course in how to do especially um science fiction and fantasy well it's a year-long course we had our first cohort just finish their year-long course unfortunately um at during the registration well unfortunately the fact is that this past year has been actually quite insane for me and uh i the registration period was really chaotic it was at a bad time and we actually didn't have enough registrations for year two of saint basil's that being said saint basil's now uh, we are starting an online community that is going to hide people over until the registration period of next year and i'm going to be inviting people next month so this is going to be a community an online community with monthly workshops uh, in the craft and business of writing that's going to prepare beginning writers to become 
uh, competent enough to actually um, be accepted to St. Basil's because St. Basil's is not a beginning rated course. It's something like advanced beginner or early intermediate. Uh, so I'm going to be preparing um, both one-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, and uh, webinar style trainings uh, within the St. Basil's online community to prepare people for the coming registration period for next year's cohort. And we are going to be opening registration in the early uh, 2024 period, probably in January. So there's, uh, we're going to have also inter an interview series, a free interview um, webinar series with all of the instructors of St. Basil that's going to be starting next month. And those are going to be free and available to everybody. Uh, basically, we're trying to, to do everything in our power to keep the um, momentum going because the people who came through the course loved it. They had a lot of wonderful things to say about it. And we're tweaking. We're making it better. There were some things that we didn't do as well as we could. Um, just those names, though, in, uh, should be enough to to inspire all of you to uh, keep your eyes open. So uh, though all of you who have signed up today, you will be getting information from me via email about this uh, online community when it becomes open for the general public. We are um, right now troubleshooting it with the first cohort that has just uh, finished. We're trying out a few things within the online community, and we're soon going to be opening it to the public very, very soon. Uh, Nathaniel Harmon is asking me about how voice is written. Can I elaborate a little bit more? It's actually not that complicated. I'll try to be as specific as I can. Voice is the thing that happens when you stick entirely to the point of view of the character that you have chosen to be inside the scene that you're writing. So what a lot of beginning writers do is they tell the story from a distance as if they are narrating it. And what that is, is basically they're superimposing themselves as writer onto a scene. So they're not actually inside the scene themselves. They're looking at it from a distance. They're talking about it. That's not storytelling. That's essay writing. So there is a way of delving deep into the point of view character that you want to write that scene or that chapter or that book in. And once you use the techniques that I teach in the course, which basically is simply being strict about seeing, hearing, feeling only the things things the viewpoint character can see feel in a given scene sometimes the viewpoint character is the narrator in, in which case the voice to be a little bit different from the character inside the scene tolkien does this and he does this to great effect by using his storytelling voice especially when you have in lord of the rings the the frequent uh, appearances of things like lo and behold that is the narrator voice coming through hopefully that gives you a little bit more uh, and if, Nathaniel, if you need more clarification, do let me know uh, in the questions. James, why do you believe that stories have potency above and beyond other social bonding activities like games, dancing, music, eating, and so on? I believe it's because um, stories allow for listeners and readers to have a very strong internal connection with the events and the characters in the stories that are happening. In other words, it is par excellence a, an experience of community even in isolation. You can have an experience of community if you're a prisoner in a cell reading a book. You can have an experience of communion with another human being if you are alone on a mountaintop. You can have an experience of living through the experiences of another human being which bonds you to that, which gives you a sense of humanity being a family a body, a single body, in a way that the other things only reach towards. Games are wonderful. They're collaborative exercises. They allow for bonding, but they allow for bonding only of the people in the room. Dancing is wonderful, but it requires physical contact. Not everybody can do it. Music is fantastic, but you need a more complicated vocabulary to fully understand it. Eating is wonderful, but you have to make the food well. Of course, that's also true of writing, but not everybody has and of course it's limited to the people at the table and it doesn't allow for the experience of something that is layered and ineffable and calls back the experiences and the realities of people who've lived before you not in not in as an immediate way as reading and storytelling does and uh when anna markham when how often is it appropriate to switch character point of view this is a good question it depends on your skill as a writer the standard answer to this question is this don't switch 
points of view within a scene. That's the stock answer. And most of the time you can stick to it, especially if you're a beginner. That being said, there's a wonderful example of, of a book of two stories by um, Virginia Woolf in the course that I, that I read to you, that I show you, where point of view is passed from one character to another seamlessly like uh, a baton in the relay race, but so seamlessly that you don't even see it. You don't even realize it's happening. You're inside it. That is a technique that is so difficult to master. Virginia Woolf was an absolutely incredible stylist. She learned how to write by hours and hours and hours of practicing. So if you get to that point, you can switch points of view in mid-scene only because the reader doesn't notice and only if the experience of the reader within the scene, the emotional resonance of what's happening in the scene is deepened by that. Most of the time it's not. Most of the time, it's something you want to avoid. In fantasy these days, there's a the, there's a common trope of having each chapter told from a separate point of view, having multiple points of view. That's difficult to sustain. If you can do it well, it's very it's a very uh, uh, very popular, very rewarding way of telling a story. It's what George R. R. Martin does. It's what I do in my novels. Uh, with the it, the issue is there's varying degrees of of love that readers have for the different characters. So they sometimes tend to put the book down if it's a character they're not immediately uh, bonded bonded to emotionally. And it's impossible to make your readers love every single one of your characters. Well, maybe it's not impossible, but it's, it's difficult. It takes a while. <clears throat> Melissa, what's your writing process? That is your routine to get yourself in your seat and your fingers on the keys without those other distractions that are always pulling. How do you balance it? <clears throat> well, it starts with, um, with blocking out time. So I have to have a firm grip on my schedule i have to i have to plan out every single minute of every single day i do and it starts out by making an ideal week i come up with an ideal week where every single day is blocked off in blocks of work that are usually from one to two hours long <laughs> sometimes three deep work is d difficult to sustain for a long time so it's better to break it up into blocks of two hours i put that ideal schedule into google calendar and at the beginning of each week, I plan out all of my events that are planned for the week, and I see what times I have available. I try to keep those times to the morning. It's my freshest time, and it's the time that coffee tastes the best <laughs> for me. Uh, there's something about coffee in the afternoon. It just doesn't taste as good. There's some. There's something about the senses being satiated. I don't drink that much coffee. It's only only about three cups a day, but... Yeah, it's it's uh, and you're always freshest in the morning. Well, not always. Some people are night owls. My wife is night owl, but for me, uh, I get the most effective writing and translation. That's my other my other way of my other deep work in the creative space. It's in the morning. So what I do is I usually leave ho leave home, and I go through those steps that I mentioned. If I'm at home and there's nobody there, or if I'm in a in a space like in a writer's retreat, I'll do all those steps where I make the coffee myself. If I don't, if I'm not in a space to make the coffee myself, I take out the coffee making section i put in headphones as i'm walking from home to my local co-op where i work coffee i bring it i set up my workstation in exactly the same way every single time <clears throat> and cycling um exercise nathaniel do you think it is useful to write or sketch out creation stories even if they are never included in the shared stories uh if you're talking about the kind of world building that gives your stories depth yes absolutely if you want to write a creation myth that is appropriate for the world that you're creating, I'm assuming this is a fantasy world, right? Yes, write it. Even if it never makes into it makes it into the story. There are two reasons for this. One, you've written it. You've put it down on paper. It's something that is real for you. It's not simply an idea. Once you write it down, it's much harder to forget it. And it's there. If you've forgotten, you've written it down. You can always look at it and remember and remind yourself, what are the rules of your world? Because it is easy to forget sometimes. The other reason is that any additional, and this, this is more of a business marketing reason, but any uh, ancillary materials that are connected to your stories, your fans love them. You give them out for free. You send them out to them uh, to, to, to get people to sign up to your newsletter list or simply to make your fans happy, even for no other reason than just to be generous. They love that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so yeah, I say do it. Absolutely. Misty, hey, good to see you. When telling a story orally, there's a lot you can convey verbally. Facial expressions, tone, gestures. Do you have tips on transliterating, transliterating what would otherwise be communicated non-verbally? I go into this in a lot of detail in the course. 
Uh, I will briefly tell you that the best way to do that is to include sound cues within your writing. In other words, use, first of all, you should should use all senses when you're describing settings, when you're um, when you're using uh, sensory details to make your story come alive. By leaning on the auditory senses, which are not frequently used by writers, you can you can um, simulate the effect of a storyteller telling a story simply by the kinds of words that they use. Effects like onomatopoeia, um, var varying the lengths of your sentences, uh, using alliteration or assonance, <clears throat> internal rhyming, things that make a reader perk up even when they're not paying attention. Those are the kinds of things that can help infuse some of that, some of that magic that an oral storyteller has. But I will tell you that there is no way of doing that 100%. Because there is a special kind of magic that an oral storyteller has that, that the written form simply cannot simulate. This is why oral storytelling is thousands of years old and written storytelling is not. Or it is, but not as long. Because really, it is a more powerful storytelling way, technique, when done well. Um, there's also ways of doing it by using point of view. So you can have a storyteller narrator character who's telling the story. If you do that, the reader will hear the story as an imagined storyteller. They won't see you, but they will see a storyteller that they provide from their own imagination. And that storyteller will have intonation that they add without even thinking about it. So it is possible to do. Oh, there are comments there. I didn't realize you can put comments in here. God, this is a cool platform. <laughs> James says, a further thought to this question, how much does medium constrain the story told? Cinema versus writing versus telling versus theater versus poetry. I mean, it it, it really does constrain. The, if the medium is the message, the medium will be the constraining force. <clears throat> so yeah, you have to be aware of what you can and what you cannot do. Uh, for more on that, read um, Robert Bres Bresson's The Art of Cinematography. Absolutely incredible book. Also, um, the uh, creative act by Rick Rubin. They, they both talk about this sort of thing too in a lot of um, in a lot of detail. So yeah, you are going to be constrained, of course. <clears throat> Michael Hudson. Hey, Michael. Good to see you. Would you recommend extensive reading of poetry as a means for prose writers looking to improve their tonal technique? Yes. Th yes. <laughs> yes. Please do. Uh, the not be not because you're going to start writing like a poet, in the sense that you're you know, you're going to, you're going to start writing in very annoying and iambic pentameter all the time, but because poetry is compressed language and imagery and metaphor. If you can compress your fiction to be as powerful as poetry, well done well, you're going to knock people's socks off. Something that, um, Martin Shaw does amazingly well. Tell us more about in a certain Kings return. I can't not yet. The reason is that I have to tell my Patreon patrons first. <laughs> uh, tomorrow I have a live stream with my uh, uh, Patreon patrons where I'm going to be uh, divulging all of that information. Uh, that information then will be made into a YouTube video and I will make it public on my YouTube channel. So James, unfortunately, I can't tell you because it would be unfair for my patrons. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, it's going to be named something a little bit different. There's going to be new music. It's a slightly different way of telling the stories. I'm no longer reading my translations i am going to be um i'm going to be telling them off the cuff i'm going to be living inside the stories longer instead of just reading them and i'm going to let them come out as they're coming out and i'm going to record it as i tell it to a live audience online pencil and paper are michael says in a certain sense all the writing tools an author must have but are there any particular tools you like for plotting and writing scrivener is the tool that i use i like it a lot uh its functionality is insanely complicated, but if you learn how to use the things that you need, it's very useful. It's useful for plotting, it's useful for writing, it's useful for organizing information. It's also useful for then formatting the stuff that you write into compilable um, documents that can be immediately exported in a way that you can, in, in a format that is suitable for submission to short stories or to editors if you're doing a novel. So Scrivener is an absolute must-have. I will tell you that in the St. Basil's online community, at the end of August, we're going to be having a Scrivener presentation. 
So keep your eye out for the um, the intro to join that community. It's a two hour long intensive on how to use Scrivener properly. It's fantastic. I've used it myself. I swear by it. It's really, really good. So keep an eye out for that. <clears throat> James, when did stories on the whole become empty shells of their old grandeur? Which epoch broke them? Industrial Revolution, Advent of Television, whatever happened at 1980 or more recently. I think that the early 2000s had a golden age of, of television, of streaming uh, TV. I think some of the best uh, TV shows ever, ever made were made during that time. I think this is very, very recent. It's something that's been brewing under the surface for a long time. There are a lot of different historical and cultural um, forces at play here. But I think it's all come together in a really, really uh, sharp and obvious way in the last 10 years or so, and especially in the last three. This is a very recent phenomenon. Uh, but it show, it's showing all the signs of being the kind of cultural decline that happens at the end of civilizations, not simply a, a wave down that's going to lead to a crest up, which is why I think it's so important that we speak into that. Paul Kingsnorth writes a lot about this in his essay series, which is going to become a book, The uh, Abbey of Misrule. If you haven't read it, do, please. Melissa, how do you connect this ritual to the practices and rituals of the church? And do you think that practicing the one helps the other? Being comfortable with ritual as a practicing Christian um, makes you recognize the value of ritual in general to bypass uh, the messed up, distracted, fallen parts of you that get in the way of the good stuff. The 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 church is the church, especially in confessions that are heavily liturgical understands that repeated patterns and repeated rituals are absolutely indispensable but not simply to enter in some sort of a state but, but to participate in uh, the, the sacramental life of the christian church in ways that are transformative so yes it's not indispensable you don't have to be a christian to recognize your rituals but all christians do because if they do the church part rituals well, they understand through their own experience how effective it is. Jason, how do I get to know the characters in my story better? Excellent question. Uh, that is a wonderful topic. You have to understand wh what your characters want, but it's not enough to know what your characters want. It's not enough to know their goals. You have to also understand their motivations, why it is that they want to do what they do. The difference between goal and motivation is something that also unlocked my writing. When I realized that it wasn't enough for a character to have simply a drive to go do something, that there needs to be an internal reason for that drive. And that reason, that internal reason, also has both external and internal manifestations. And the two of those are connected. So the world outside, in some ways, mirrors both the conflicts and the desires and the motivations of the character. When you do that, when you combine the world building and intertwine it with the character's motivations and desires, you create a an immersive experience that simulates reality in a very effective way, much more effective than, than computer games. Because that's the way the world works. Or rather, that's the way we perceive the world. That's the way we walk through the world. Because the only things we pay attention to are the things that directly affect us. The only things we have emotional responses to are the things that directly affect us. We don't see everything. We have, don't have the ability to, to not parse out of the entire mass of sensory perception those things that are important to us because they affect us directly. So if you can get your characters to combine their desires, their drives, their motivations, the outside world, and the conflicts that happen externally, you create a real human being. Sometimes it's helpful to think of a real human being when you're crafting that character. There's a technique to do this well. There is an actual technical way of doing it. It's called a GMC chart, goals, goal motivation. Too complicated and long a subject to discuss here. It's not in the Art of Storytelling course, but I am preparing another course for later on this year. It's called Motiv Motivating Your Lazy Characters, uh, where I'm going to be going into goals, motivations, and conflicts in a lot of detail. So if this is something that is very uh, important for you, keep an eye out. I will have that course. It's going to be uh, a mini course. It's not going to be as, uh, it's going to be a little bit cheaper than this one. Matt, how do you know what to include in your writing ritual? That's an excellent question. Um, 
you don't. You have to try them out. So there's two things you have to do. You have to think of the kinds of things that you enjoy. Try to put them together in ways that are easy to do and pleasurable for you. And also create a space between the thing that you did before. Not necessarily a physical space. It could just be a space of <coughs> a change of activity. But you need to stick with it for at least two weeks. The brain doesn't like change. And it takes sometimes as long as six weeks for a habit to be fully formed. But it takes two weeks for that habit to become something that the brain becomes comfortable with enough not to constantly throw roadblocks on way. So think of the things that you enjoy. It can be something that's scent related. You can put scented candles in your space. You can change the lighting. You can change the music. You can walk around the block. You can do 10 burpees. You can change the kind of music you listen to. You can read something. You can do it in any combination of things. As long as those things are pleasurable and you do them consistently over time, eventually, if you continue to do it and if you continue to force yourself to write, because yes, you do have to force yourself, your brain will eventually understand it's safe to do this because you're going to get good, um, you're going to get good words out of it this way. How do you come up with a story idea that is capable of holding great truths? Uh, the way you do that is by, is by becoming a human being who, contain, who contains great truths within himself. That is a life project. And force those, those truths onto your story. They come out of you organically. As soon as you start or try to force them onto the page in a way that is uh, intentional, your reader will feel preached and they will not like it at all. So you have to work on yourself, on becoming the best version of Matt, the best human being you can be, and then the truths come out organically. Why was why is Tolkien's Lord of the Rings so popular? Why is it so loved? Because Tolkien was a profound man of great intelligence and knowledge. And that knowledge and intelligence just comes out through every pore of his storytelling. It didn't. You didn't infuse it. It just came out. That's how you do it. That's hard. Yeah. <laughs> will the recording be posted online? Yes, it will. We will have a replay link sent to your email. Hopefully soon. What makes an omniscient third... John is asking, what makes an omniscient third person narrator different from head hopping? Uh, an omniscient third person narrator will most likely not allow head hopping to, to happen within a scene. If he head hops, it's between scenes. So omniscient third person is a distance narrator who's telling the story as though he were God, looking at every though. He has the full to go into the head of any one of the characters at any given time. A bad omniscient third person narrator will jump in and out of people's heads without thinking about the emotional and dramatic tension of the scene. So yeah, you can as an omniscient third person narrator head hop. It's a bad idea. It makes for bad writing. Robert Hegwood, Seraphim, hi. Omniscient can still focus on one character per scene. Another scene, another character focus. Exactly, yeah. Steven Pincus, could you lay out your detailed criteria for full-time writing? How did the 10K a day number come about? Uh, it was a, it was a, um, oh, uh, that's, that's a, that's oftentimes a, a number that professional writers try to reach. It's a nice round number. There's no reason why you have to. Um, it just feels kind of hefty hefty and big that's all yeah there's there's no particular uh reason why that be a, a number that you that you aim for speed in writing is is entirely personal if you want to become a prolific writer if you want to become a successful writer financially you, you probably have to become prolific in which case you want to try to up your word count as much as you can but it's of the art because if, if you become prolific and you keep prolificating garbage um it's gonna wear on you and your reader Detailed criteria for full-time writing. That is a it's a bigger question. I think the the answer is as soon as your writing becomes profitable enough to support you, then you can consider yourself a full-time writer. Daniel Mellon, what is your opinion on writing instructors like Robert McKee and John Truby? I love both of them. Please read them. They're fantastic. Yeah, both of those guys. John Truby's latest book on genre is already a classic as far as I'm concerned. Robert McKee's workshops on story? Yes. Because screenwriting uh, forces you to tell streamlined, effective, powerful stories. So yeah, do it. Read both of those guys. Or I don't know if McKee is still doing uh, in-person workshops. If he is, go get him. 
Yeah, Anatomy of Genre is a fantastic book. Simeon, hey. When telling stories in the modern world, should one revive the old stories or make new ones? I'm exploring the life of St. Olaf of Norway, and I'm sure I'm not sure if I want to write about St. Olaf directly or write a new story based on his life. I think both kinds of stories have uh, have a place. Um, Jonathan is writing the the first. Jonathan Pejo is reviving old stories in his new series in Symbolic World Press. What I'm doing is making new ones inspired by the old. Both of those have, have a place. Both of those are valid. Both of those can be very powerful. Uh, do what you feel like. Do what you your heart wants you to. Don't feel like you have to be uh, limited by um, external uh, demands of the market or, or something else. Do what you feel like. Should super beginners focus so much on technique? Seems like one could get bogged down. Um, this is why taking a course is helpful because it helps you focus on the things that are important. Uh, super beginners absolutely need to focus on technique. Yes. Uh, it's not a super beginner problem to get bogged down in details. It's an always problem to get bogged down in details. Super beginners can um, jumpstart their development by understanding from the beginning what works and what doesn't. You might save yourself a lot of heartache. I'll just give you an example. My first novel, Raven Sun, I actually published it. Uh, the Song of the Seer in its first version was called Raven Sun. I published it in 2014. I didn't do anything. It was badly written. I eventually took it off the market. I ended up rewriting word for word the entire novel. That was hard. But I rewrote it after understanding the techniques and what works and what doesn't. So some of the stuff stayed, some 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 of the things some of the things were completely different. It made for a much better novel, though, I can tell you that. So I don't think it's a super beginner problem to get focused, to get bogged down in details. But uh don't don't read too much either. There are some books that I that I absolutely recommend uh, for for beginners. If you want to get a really great super beginner book, you can't do wrong uh, by starting with um, "Techniques for the Selling Writer" by Dwight Swain. I'll put that in the uh, in the chat. Techniques of the Selling Writer by Swain. That's a great book. It's easy to read. It's very simple. It's um, it's good for both beginners and advanced people. So, but definitely for beginners. Uh, Kate, I seem to have missed your question. I'm sorry. I recently took a screenwriting class and I've been pondering the idea of adopting fairy tales into screenplays. I'd love your thoughts or advice on attempting anything of the sort. Uh, please. <laughs> the adapted fairy tales as screenplays nowadays are all inverted subverted versions of classic fairy tales and i hate them have you, have you ever watched the old jim henson the storyteller show how effective and wonderful those old classic fairy tales were with those wonderful puppets if you've never seen it kate look it up you can I think you can find it on, on uh, amazon prime uh it's called the storyteller it's fantastic john hurt was the storyteller for a while then it was uh, michael gambon for a bit really great stuff so yeah the those stories they're i mean they're told in a way that lends itself naturally to screenwriting. So absolutely do it. Snow Queen would be a fantastic movie. Oh my goodness. That's such a powerful story. Kate, please do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Brittany, what are your thoughts on things like serialized fiction? Does the kind of storytelling we're talking about here have a place in shorter form fiction? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Serialized fiction is different only in the sense that you have to have an open loop at the end of each uh, episode. I'm not a serial fiction writer. It does have its own rules, but you still have to keep the kind of dramatic tension within the scene that is going to be true of any uh, genre. So yeah, absolutely. It's still, it still fits. The only thing you're going to need to adapt is the end. Anna from Matt, how do you come up with the story idea that is capable of the irony answer? Okay. <laughs> How do you approach stuff like outlining and planning your story ahead of time? Do you typically go through the same ritual processes? Or do you approach the planning stage differently from the actual writing stage? Uh, my planning stage depends uh, depends on the project. Some projects I don't have an outlining stage at all. I think about a story a lot and I jump in and the story just tells itself. If they're more complicated, I need to have scene breakdowns, uh, especially if it's a story with multiple uh, points of view. So I'll do a um, like a graphic representation of 
uh, in different color codes of all this, the uh, chapters based on who's telling the scene, which point of view is being told. And so that, then I can look to see what the what the balance of tension is, whether the, whether it's an active scene or a passive scene to make sure that I'm not boring the, the reader. But I'm not um, I'm not a big proponent of strict strict planning and outlining. I kind of sometimes I need a lot of it. Sometimes I don't. Every writer is different on planning and outlining. You need to figure out what works for you. So you may have to try out an outlining handbook and then try a, a pantser handbook, which is a non-planner. Uh, there are a lot of them out there. Uh, Writing into the Dark by Dean Wesley Smith is a great one for people who don't want to outline. Uh, I don't have any good outlining uh, books because I've never I've never done full outline. So, uh, but you can find them online. All right, what else did I miss here? These are great questions, by the way. Thank you all. Uh, Anne, hi. How do you control your story from becoming too far reaching if you just want to tell one simple tale? When I let my mind go into my characters, images and ideas come into my head and I find it's hard to wind my way back to the original story. What could be happening is that you actually haven't started your story and you're finding your way to the place where you want to begin. It's called writing yourself into the story. That happens a lot, um, especially for people who need to bypass their critical brain and the critical brain gets in, gets involved in the writing process, welcome that. It's okay. Uh, in Rick Rubin's The Creative Act, he talks. He has a wonderful uh, chapter on editing. Editing well is possibly the greatest thing you can learn as a writer outside of these rules. Because if you can learn how to pair your art to the absolute minimum that it needs to be to be the most powerful it can be, You've unlocked something fantastic. That comes with time and practice. So I think don't be afraid of writing a lot because you can always cut. And some, sometimes the things that you cut, you set them aside, you put them in a special folder of not yet killed darlings. Those of you who understand the reference will know what I'm talking about. And sometimes you can resurrect those in different stories. You can use them as behind the scenes stuff for your readers. You can do little mini episodes out of them. You should never throw anything out. Just go with it. To use a point of view and motivation for the environment, your characters. Oh, what a great question, David. So how do you make your setting a character? Oh, yes. If you can make your setting a character, you've unlocked something fantastic. It's something I tried to do in my last novel, no, uh, novella, The Son of the Deathless. The way you do it is by being in nature a lot and understanding how nature feels and looks. Because if you, let's say that you live in a place that doesn't have a lot of natural beauty, but there's a park not far away from you. Rather than constantly finding new stimulation for yourself in the natural world, go to that one place again and again and again and spend a lot of time in it. Find different places in it that you can stare at for a long time. Touch, feel, listen, be with your closed eyes. Just experience it in and out of different seasons and see the same places, acquire different characters and tonalities based on the time of year that is happening. There's one wonderful walk just outside my home that goes along a paved road uh, through a forest all the way to a beautiful lake. I walk. I used to walk that every day. Now, now I walk it less frequently for various reasons. But when I walked it every day, I would see different character to that place every single day. It's really remarkable how vibrant nature isn't it's also remarkable how badly we pay attention to it that's something i would definitely recommend okay how about multiple first person points of view yes that's that is possible it's difficult it's more difficult than multiple third point uh, third person uh but i have seen multiple first person um the, the reason it's difficult is because Unless you indicate who the character is at the beginning, because you're saying "I," uh, sometimes the reader will be will take a while to adjust to under, to the scene to, and might not understand where they are. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely uh, it's a very effective technique if you can do it well. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> My favorite way of finding story seeds. Okay, so for me, how how do I find story seeds? I don't look for story seeds. I read widely, and I listen to audiobooks and interesting. Um, podcasts in a variety of different um, subjects because cross-pollination happens in unexpected places. 
I try to read very widely and try to listen very widely and I try to give time and space for, for those activities. And then I try to give myself time to think, take walks, take runs where you don't listen to anything, just allow your mind to wander. Incredible things happen. When I'm biking up a, up a hill, I'm listening to a business podcast and suddenly I've had the perfect solution to a story problem. There's nothing to do with the podcast, but just something that somebody said clicked something. That's my favorite way of doing it. It's just being open to sources of information and they are very wide, as wide as I possibly can make them. Yeah, you have to constantly feed yourself with different and different sources of beauty and information. Opal Whitley, uh, Sarah, I thought you were going to say Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> Opal Whitley is a great inspiration for getting into nature's mind. Highly recommended. Yeah, I agree. Prince of Tides opening is great at landscape as character. Paul King's North's uh, The Wake is a wonderful example of landscape as character as well. Matt, your daughter is interested in writing as well. She wants to know what advice you have for young writers. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I don't think that age is as important as some people might think. The only thing is that is to keep in, to keep in mind is that as a young writer, you feel like you ha you know everything. And when your story starts to come to do the thing the stories do, when it starts to come out of you in free form, you you will feel like you've written the greatest thing you've ever written. That's a wonderful feeling. It's not indicative of reality. <laughs> it's indicative of, of you reaching a wonderful place with the creative process that you want to cultivate. It, it's not a reflection of the, of the quality of the writing, unfortunately. And the, the simple reality is, until you get older, you're really not going to understand, probably, the intricacies of, of um, the dynamics of human relationships as well. So you want to avoid certain topics, probably certain types of stories that you simply just don't know as much about. You know, don't, don't write a story about... Um, it's probably more difficult for you to write about, you know, be an old, person, an, old, an old person dying, unless you're actually talking to a grandparent who's dying or something like that. But yeah, I think writers have amazing... Young writers have amazing energy. And the more they cultivate that, the more they write into it, the better they're going to become earlier so that they can get to a point where they become publishable much faster. There's some wonderful writers out there who are publishing books regularly that are in their 20s. So there's no reason why you can't. Misty, another question. Thank you for so patiently answering all these questions. Yeah, absolutely. My, my pleasure. I haven't done this in a while, and I, I, I do enjoy it very much. Tyler, should beginning writers start with short stories, then move on to novellas, then novels? No, <laughs> not unless you really love short stories. Short stories are much more difficult to write than novels much more difficult. Same same issue as poetry. You have to compress all of the things that you can do expansively in novels into a very tight setting and a tight, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? A very tight uh, form. It's difficult to do well. It takes a lot of practice and you have to read a lot of short stories. You have to like short stories, read them and and really understand the technique by, by looking at what writers, what short story writers do. And trying to emulate that. I would actually start with maybe novellas. They're simpler because you can have a, an expansive story, but it's usually told from one point of view. And you can allow yourself the space to develop ideas and, and themes a little bit. So I would say maybe novella first, but you can start with novels as well. Some Sometimes novellas, I mean, for myself, novellas are easier. I like novellas a lot because I can really um, tell a, a, a short and sweet story very quickly. And I enjoy that. Um, but that could just be a, a taste thing for me. When getting feedback from readers on a new work, what do you attend to and what do you ignore? Um, so I make sure to ask very specific questions that have nothing to do with... So Okay, let, let me re reframe that. I ask questions that gauge emotional responses. I don't ask them to comment on technical, uh, on technical things in the writing. I ask them about their emotional responses. If they tell me that scene made me weep, then I've done something wrong. If they tell me that character doing that annoyed me, I perk up. Then I have to find out whether that's just a personal thing that they have with that character or it's something to do with their own personal life. That also could be the case. So that's in that case, you you have strength in numbers. So the more people repeat that same comment for that same character or scene or plot point, uh, the better the information is. As always, with more data, you're going to get more accurate information. But always read um, reader responses with a bit of skepticism. Uh, and you want to make sure that the readers that you give your work to are people that you trust, uh, either personally or because you know that they understand story. So sometimes it's fellow writers, but make sure that those writers aren't jealous types. <laughs> Short stories are the best, if written well. 
They can be quite awful if not. Yeah, uh, Seraphim, hopefully that answered your question about feedback on re uh, from readers. Uh, it's great to see uh, active chat during this. That was wonderful. I'm so glad that that, uh, that this was useful for you all. Uh, and most of you stuck around for the Q&A. That's lovely. Um, do we have any more questions? And am I missing something? I think I think we're basically yeah I think we're basically almost at the end so don't forget uh, we have only two hours left and I see I just opened up and it looks like a few of you have already purchased thank you so much uh, don't forget that you do have to do more than some waystone press uh, you have to actually uh, purchase the course right and that's that's a bit of a confusing thing on teachable um, Uh, so yeah, I will, I will be featuring other courses on Teachable as well. So if you join just the school on Teachable, you will get um, notifications about new courses that I put up. Do I envision a publishing house? Um, there is possibly some news on that end, Seraphim, soon. So keep your ears open. Esther, is the workshop good for screen artists as well as authors? <clears throat> um, it won't give you the details of how to write a screenplay in the technical sense. In terms of what the technical specs of a screenplay are, you know how to space things, how to write an intro, what to include, what not. It will tell you about the fundamentals of story and how to use language powerfully. So, if you're working on style, if you need to work on your style, on how to make your language more powerful, on how to make your stories more compelling, yeah, it, it can definitely help. Any in-person events on the horizon? Uh Yes, I'm uh, I'm uh, keynoting at Doxicon this year in November. Uh, that is in Maryland, I believe, near the, in the DC area. November November third and fourth, I believe. I'm also speaking on the subject of stories in uh, Ithaca. Is it Ithaca? No, it's in Dartmouth. I'm speaking in Dartmouth in September, and I'm going to be speaking at a very cool event called the Art of the Tamada in November in the Florida Keys. Uh, that one, I th I'm not sure if there's any um, spots available for that. If you want to know about any of those in detail, uh, do uh, keep keep yourself signed up to my newsletter. I talk about all these things with my regular newsletter subscribers. <laughs> all right. I think we're out of questions. Thank you all very much for coming. It's a real pleasure to be doing these webinars again. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be doing more of these within the more closed confines, probably a smaller space uh, in inside St. Basil's uh, online writing community. Like I said, don't run away from my uh, newsletter. I'll be telling you more about that there uh, in the near future. And uh, I will be doing another shorter course in November about motivating your lazy character. So keep an eye out for that. The link gives two choices, says David. Sign up with email, continue with Teachable. Which one? You can do both. Um, either one is fine. Either one should should allow you to work. Um, I, have, I, have a, I have a sneaking suspicion that you probably should do it by continuing with Teachable, David. That probably makes it easier. Uh, usually when I when I do it, I do it with Teachable, but that's because I have a Teachable account already. So that you may have to do it if you already have a Teachable account. Teachable is very annoying. <laughs> I am working on it, and uh, eventually we're going to be hosting it on a much better platform. For now, this is what we have. Uh, Anna says she's done it by email, too, and that works. Excellent. <clears throat> All right. It's 10 o'clock. We've been doing this for two. Oh, my goodness, two hours. <laughs> My head is throbbing a little bit, um, but it's been a great pleasure uh, talking to you all. Thank you all for being such a lively audience. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, they they were fantastic. I'm glad to see so many, uh, so many intelligent, thinking, com compelling storytellers in the audience. And I hope you will all be drawing me in with your stories very soon, with your published uh, stories. And uh, like I said, I will possibly have an avenue for you all to publish soon. So keep an eye out on that. In the meantime, that's enough for me. It's time for me to rejoin my dear family. 
uh, if they're still awake. <laughs> Not even sure. <laughs> uh, good night, everyone. This, was, this has been a real pleasure. Thanks very much. See you all next time.